All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Stan Sexton. I'm a retired partner here at Shook, Hardy & Bacon. I got drafted into duty this evening. Madeline McDonough, our, uh, our chair, uh, is in California on business and can't make it here. But on her behalf and on behalf of all the members of our firm, I'd like to th uh, thank you for coming and invite you to attend this, uh, hopefully, a very informative session on, on the Sunshine Law here in the state of Missouri. Uh, with that, I would introduce you to Ann Calvert, who is the president of the League of Women Voters, Kansas City, Jackson, Platt, and Clay Counties. Ann? Thank you, Sam. Good evening, and thank you for coming. I'm Ann Calvert, as Stan said, the president of the League of Women Voters of Kansas City, Jackson, Clay, and Platt Counties. Uh, I want to thank our hosts, Chuck Hardy and Bacon, for their generosity in providing us this wonderful setting for tonight's program, and all the tech support, too. A giant shout out to the, to the tech people. Uh, first, a word about the League. We are an active, non nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. We neither support nor oppose candidates or political parties, but after careful deliberation and development of positions, we do take a stand on issues of concern to our members and the public. Some of the things we do include voter registration, voter education, candidate forums, printed voter guides, and get out the vote activities. We have an observer corps sitting in on government meetings and even have a podcast to let people know what le legislation is coming up in the state house. We are here tonight to talk about the Sunshine Law, which broadly represents a foundation of democratic government, the right of the people to know the actions of those elected and performing the people's work in government. In just a moment, I will introduce our moderator, but first a little housekeeping. We expect a lively and informative discussion from our panelists, and we welcome you to participate also. If you have a question you'd like the panel to address, please write it on a card and raise your hand. Our attendants will collect the cards for the moderator, who will then work the questions into the flow of the discussion as time permits. If you need a card, you can raise your hand now. We'll bring you one now. Um, those of you who are participating online on Zoom, please write your question in the Q&A box, not the chat. All right, and now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Dan Margulies, because we're only allowing people who have names that rhyme with Ann or Stan or Dan. <laughs> Mr. Margulies has been a journalist in the Kansas City metro area for decades, working for the Kansas City Business Journal, the Kansas City Star, and most recently, KCUR Public Media. He is also a lawyer and spent his journalism career covering breaking news and legal affairs, always seeking to demystify complex issues and demonstrate how they impact the public. Retired as a journalist, Mr. Margulies can still be found on public radio as co-host of the Kansas City Symphony on Classical KC. Mr. Margulies, thank you for being our moderator. Pleasure. All right, and we are ready to begin. Thank you, Ann. Thank you, Stan. <laughs> Um, I hope I didn't misunderstand, but in addition to discussing Missouri's Sunshine Law, uh, I'd also like to discuss Kansas's analogous law, right? The Kansas Open Records Act or CORA. And we're also going to discuss the uh, Federal Freedom of Information Act, otherwise known as FOIA. Um, but first, let me thank both the League of Women Voters and um, Shook, Hardy & Bacon for uh, making this event happen. Um, these laws, these open records laws, are crucial. Uh, they're aimed at providing transparency and accountability in government. And again... Those laws are predicated on the notion that in Abraham Lincoln's famous formulation, we are a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. So I want to say that it's altogether appropriate 
that this event is sponsored by the League of Women Voters, because as Anne said, since its founding in 1920, its mission has been to empower everyone to fully participate in our democracy. So again, let me thank the League once again for hosting this event on an all important topic. Before we kick off uh, our discussion, let me introduce uh, our three distinguished panelists in alphabetical order by their last names. So to my immediate left is Jason Lewis. He is chief counsel of the governmental affairs section in the Missouri Attorney General's office. He has led that section since uh, 2021 after previously serving as assistant deputy attorney general for special litigation and working in other roles in the office. He joined the attorney general's office in 2016, and he is also an adjunct associate professor of law at the University of Missouri Law School, through which he teaches and directs the law school's practicum program in the attorney general's office. To Jason's left is Gene Manneke, who has been practicing media, publishing, and entertainment law for more than 25 years. That's hard to believe, Gene. In addition to her work for individual clients, she represents, uh, she serves as general counsel for uh, the Missouri Press Association. She, like me, is uh, a former journalist, she worked as a reporter for numerous newspapers and magazines, including, for those of you who remember a time when we had two newspapers in this town, two daily newspapers, the Kansas City Times, which was the morning paper, and the Kansas City Star, of course, was the evening paper. And then uh, they folded the Kansas City Star, but uh, in 1991, I believe it was, and the Kansas City Times was the surviving paper, but they gave it the name of the Kansas City Star because that was the better known name. Last but certainly not least is uh, uh, sitting to Gene's left is Bernie Rhodes, who has been a lawyer at Lathrop and Gage, as it's now known, it's gone through different iterations, um, for 30 years, for more than 30 years. He has a national trial and appellate practice and has appeared in council in more than 100 reported decisions. He also leads a national team of attorneys who represent a variety of print, film, television, and online media companies in First Amendment, intellectual property, and other matters. He's also frequently called upon to conduct internal corporate investigations. Um, I should say in the interest of full disclosure that he has represented me and the various news outlets for which I have worked over my 37 some years as a journalist in Kansas City on numerous occasions. And I am happy to say that in every instance in which we were sued for defamation or some other similar type of tort, uh, we prevailed. So uh, I, am, I, I will confess right here and now that I am thankful to Bernie for pulling my tuchus out of the fire any number of times. All right, so let me kick off uh, tonight's discussion by asking through a show of hands of uh, the people here in person, uh, how familiar or if you're generally familiar with uh, open records or sunshine laws. Great, that's the majority of you. Uh, then I won't spend too much time explaining what they are, but in brief, they are laws at both the state and federal levels requiring, with enumerated exceptions, that government meetings and records be open, available, and accessible to the public. In Kansas, as I mentioned before, that law is known as the Kansas, uh, the Kansas Open Records Act, or CORA. In Missouri, it's known as the Missouri Sunshine Law. Other states have different names for their open records laws. Many of them use the widely used uh, Appalachian term Freedom of Information Act, which is also the name of one of the most important federal open records laws 
a law that governs access to federal agency records, documents, meetings, and rulings. And I want to say, speaking as a journalist, that I cannot overemphasize how important and critical these laws are in shining light uh, and prying open, shining light on and prying open matters that government officials might prefer that we not know about. And I'm just going to give you a, a handful of examples from my own career as a journalist, and I could cite dozens and dozens because that's how frequently I took advantage of these laws. Um, one of them concerned Planned Parenthood. And this was the case in Kansas. Kansas was frequently, as is the case in Missouri, trying to defund Planned Parenthood. And Planned Parenthood some years ago sued the state of Missouri as a preemptive measure because uh, it knew that, uh, I'm sorry, sued the state of Kansas because it, uh, the state of Kansas had made it clear, this was under Governor Brownback, that they were going to attempt to defund it. So the state, typically the attorney general's office will defend those kinds of actions. But in this case, for whatever reason, the state of Kansas hired outside counsel, a boutique law firm based in Washington, D.C., that consisted almost entirely of former U.S. Supreme Court law clerks. So right away, I'm thinking, gee, that's a very pricey law firm. I wonder how much in the way of taxpayer money is being used to uh, pay these attorneys to defend what was likely to be a losing cause on the part of the state. And indeed, they did lose that lawsuit. So I filed a CORA request. And the answer I got back from uh, the attorney general's office was that uh, they didn't have any records. I, I, I had requested the invoices of the law firm and their response was they didn't have any such records. And I responded to their response by saying, I find that hard to believe unless they're doing this work for you pro bono, gratis, free of charge, there are invoices. And lo and behold, all of a sudden, they discovered the invoices. Turned out the law firm was charging, its billable rates amounted to $100,000 a month. And I got the first three months worth of invoices and they came out to 300,000. Eventually, the state of Kansas paid over a million dollars to this law firm in this losing cause. Another instance was uh, I did a story when I was at KCUR about a cover-up at KU Medical Center. They had misdiagnosed a woman with pancreatic cancer. Those kinds of things happen in hospitals, you know, not infrequently. So, but the story here was the cover-up, a prominent physician at the hospital had filed a whistleblower lawsuit against the hospital, claiming that the hospital was trying to cover this up. I wound up doing a story about his whistleblower lawsuit, and it turned out the woman who was misdiagnosed, who had never been informed that she had been misdiagnosed, learned about her misdiagnosis from the story I did. Horrendous. Well, eventually KU settled the case on a confidential basis. I knew that that settlement had to be in the many millions of dollars, but how was I going to get that information? And I had this uh, rather outre, far out thought. There is an obscure agency in the state of Kansas called the Healthcare Stabilization Fund that is designed to stabilize insurance rates for healthcare providers. And I filed a record request with that agency. And I have never received such a, an expeditious response to one of the requests in my entire career. They responded within 24 hours and gave me all the information. They said that this healthcare stabilization fund had paid over and above whatever KU's private insurers paid out several million dollars. That told me that 
the private insurers had paid way many multiples of that to settle the case. One last example, and then we'll get to our panelists. I'm working on a book right now about a woman named Esther Brown. She was a remarkable civil rights activist in the mid 20th century who lived in Miriam, Kansas, and who became enraged when that city built a new public school and excluded the black uh, residents of Miriam. It was actually called South Park, an unincorporated part of Miriam from attending that school. She filed a lawsuit. She spearheaded a lawsuit that eventually resulted in the integration of that school five years before Brown v. Board of Education, a different Brown. Well, she was investigated by the FBI for these nefarious activities. And I filed a FOIA request, a federal, uh, I mean, a, a FOIA request with the FBI for that file. And I got it in highly redacted form. I'm still fighting the FBI right now because they redacted it, blacked out portions of it, supposedly to protect the identities of people who had basically ratted Esther Brown out. Except those people are long dead. This FBI investigation was conducted in 1949. So we're talking about 75 years ago why they're trying to protect the identities of people who are no longer alive i have no idea but i'm still fighting it the point being that these laws as these three examples that i just gave i think illustrate is how important they are to shine a light as i said before on what our own governments local state and federal are up to so i'm going to turn to bernie first and um I'm going to ask you about a case that I did write about in the interest of full disclosure. Several years ago, Bernie, you represented a nonprofit group called Reclaim the Records, a genealogy research organization that had made a request for birth and death records in the state of Missouri going back to 1916, uh, I believe it was. So would you tell us in brief what happened after they made that request? how you got involved, and what the ultimate outcome of that matter was. So in 2016, uh, a group of computer nerds and genealogists, I mean, imagine how exciting their holiday parties are. <laughs> they probably don't even have liquor. Uh, made it, made a, a two sunshine law request to the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services. This is a group who, as a hobby, uses open records laws to get birth and death indexes, you know, to compete with the ancestries of uh, uh, .com of the world. And they, they get these and they do their fancy computer stuff with them and they put them on the web for free. They made a request to the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services for death indexes, not the actual certificates, just who died on what date, from 1910 to current, and a similar request for birth records. Uh, within the, the three-day period, which we'll talk about, they got a response saying, we're working on your request, we'll get you an estimate. The estimate came in, we can provide this, it'll be $1.49 million. <laughs> it will take 35,000 hours at 40 some dollars an hour. And you know, it may come in your lifetime, it may not. <laughs> Uh, that's when they hired me. I reached out to the department and said, excuse me, but there must be a mistake here. Can you explain your computer architecture? What kind of mainframe are you using? What kind of programming are you using? Because I think I can help you. This is not my first rodeo. So they gave, provided me that information. I consulted with, with my folks, came back, gave them the protocol they could use. They came back and said, oh, you're right, we could do it for $5,000. And I said, no, you're wrong. It's more like 50 bucks. <laughs> At which time they came back and said, upon reconsideration, your request is denied. 
what I didn't know was while all of this fighting was going about the cost, they were consulting with the former state registrar. That's the one person the government puts in charge of vital statistics, vital records. He had retired, but yet he had a sincere interest in this. And we eventually sued. And during the course of discovery, the process of taking depositions, getting records from the other side, we uncovered the email that the former state registrar had sent to the department saying, I would deny this request and make them sue you. In the meantime, you could draft a new regulation exempting these. And if that doesn't work, you'll have enough time once you sue them to go to the legislature to change the law to make these confidential. Abraham Lincoln was turning over in his grave <laughs> when I got these records. Uh, they were unsuccessful to the legislature's credit, unsuccessful in convincing the legislature to change the law. Uh, we sued. We won. The court found splitting the difference between the 5000 they later said and the 550 bucks I said. The court said the real cost would be $2,500. Not 1.49 million, not even 5,000. You're wrong to deny the request. These are clearly public records. The court fined the department $12,000 and ordered the department to pay my attorney fees of um, $137,000 after five years of litigation. Not my friend Jason, but someone else in his department didn't like that and appealed. They lost the appeal and it paid me another $7,500 <laughs> in attorney fees. It took five years, but what are clearly public records, I mean, I mean, the department essentially admitted they were department records, public records, and they said, well, let's try to change the law so we can keep them from being public records. It cost you, me, Jason, Gene, Dan's one of those Kansas people. <laughs> Tax dollars to pay for all of this. And today, literally, if you Google today Missouri death records or Missouri birth records, you're taken to the Reclaim the Records website. Mm -hmm. Every year now since then, the, the Reclaim the Records copies me on their Sunshine Law Request to the Department for the updated list <laughs> of birth and death records. So we, we think of the Sunshine Law as being used by people like Dan, journalists. And that's a big part of what I do. But this is a classic example of, of citizens. Uh, those of you, I, I presume if you're here, you're likely from the Kansas City area. You may remember a couple of years ago was the, the horrific incident in Overland Park where an Overland Park police officer shot a 17-year-old boy as he backed his family minivan out of the family garage. His only crime was being caught driving a minivan. The officer shot and killed him. Uh, the city of Overland Park threw up all kinds of objections to producing any records. The chief of police went on television and swore that the officer just resigned. The mom, Sheila Albers, a true American hero, mm. wouldn't let that go. Would not let that go. And she kept at it and kept at it and kept at it. And literally one day was doing a Google search of the officer's name. The officer had killed her son. And so there are some public websites, they're called scrapers, uh, commercial entities that go to public websites and scrape information and put it on the web. And then they sell advertising around it, but it's public record. She went to one of those and she saw a big bump in salary for this officer the year that he quit. She's like, well, that's weird. He only worked a couple of months. Why was he making so much money? She put in a Kansas Open Records Act request for his pay records. Come to find out, the officer hadn't quit. They'd bought his silence with a huge severance package. Mm. Again, we talk about these, these records exist for transparency. That's another example of somebody like you or me doing this, not a journalist, not, not somebody being paid to do it, but doing it because they believe in better government. So. There's, there's two examples right there of ordinary citizens using these laws for what they were intended for.
So, uh, Jason, not to put you on the spot, but because you are the representative here of the Missouri Attorney General's Office, and again, we thank you very much for agreeing to appear on this panel. Um, getting back to the Reclaim the Records case, which involved the most anodyne kind of records. I mean, birth and death records, what could be more anodyne? And again, I understand that this was not your thing there, but why would uh, the state have opposed such a thing and, and gone to such great lengths uh, to fight it at great taxpayer expense, as Bernie explained, uh, only to lose as probably it, inevit it inevitably was bound to do. Sure. And yeah, Dan, Dan, that's a great question. Without having been on the case, it's you know difficult to kind right. of speculate what you know, motives would have been. And you know, maybe Bernie found some interesting information and discovery. But uh, you know, one thing that we in the Attorney General's office see um, from our state agency clients, but also from some local governmental entities, is there are sometimes some laws that make it a crime or maybe some civil imposition if the holder of the public record, so the government agency that keeps the records, improperly discloses things, accidentally releases things. This happens a lot in the medical context. Um, I know the Department of Health and Senior Services, they have a lot of statutes and, and regulations that make it um, you know, prohibited to, to open certain information. At the local level, this happens with some frequency with law enforcement, especially there might be, you know, criminal penalties or civil penalties if the agency happens to improperly release things. Right. So that's where you often see loggerheads, where you have on the one hand, the, the sunshine law in the interest of transparency, the public preserve the records, the public pays for the governmental agencies. We have the interest of transparency that sometimes have this competing interest with penalties for a governmental entity if they improperly disclose something. So perhaps that is, you know, some mo motivation here. Uh, you know, in the AG's office, we, we tend to take a, a pretty dim view from, from local governmental entities when they're trying to, you know, close too much, you know, withhold too much from the public. The presumption definitely should be openness. And that's what the Sunshine Law says, that everything is presumed to be open as the default. The thumb on the scale is for openness unless you can point to something, right, that will actually close something. So in our office, uh, you know, we, we get complaints from, from the public you know, all the time, sometimes from journalists, sometimes the media, from organizations. But most of the complaints that we get in our office are from citizens that have a complaint with a local governmental entity. We get, last year we had a record of about 400 75, I want to say, complaints, which is quite a lot. Uh, when I started in the attorney general's office, uh, the last year of the Chris Coster administration, we were receiving maybe 150. So we've tripled the citizen complaints that we get roughly in about, you know, seven, eight, nine years. And, uh, you know, one of the primary complaints that we get are from citizens that are complaining against their local government. Most government happens at the local level, right? I think we know this. That's where most tax dollars are spent. That's where you have citizens participating in town halls. And citizens run into this a lot with local governmental entities that, uh, you know, maybe sometimes it's uh, you know, a matter of wanting to do your best and not to violate a law from disclosing too much. But sometimes maybe there's something lurking behind the scenes. And that's what we're really curious to get, you know, in our office to find those complaints. Um, yeah, you know, maybe Bernie found something in that case. I'd be actually kind of curious to see if, if Bernie did have some uh, speculation about why there might have been some, some decisions to close those records. Do you want to it, it, it address was, that, Bernie? It, yeah. it, 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 it was the deep state. <laughs> uh, I'm, be, I'm being dead serious. Oh. These were government officials who thought they were their records. Um, the, the eventual decision to deny, they, they literally described it as their discretion. They were choosing not to provide this. And, and Jason is 1,000% correct in this, if you graph these complaints that his office receives, because guess what? The people who can't afford a lawyer called Jason, the people who can afford a lawyer called Gene and I, <laughs> and our business is <laughs> on that same track. And we could suggest that it all starts with a particular former president who believed in fake news. <laughs> 
And there, there was no doubt that in the last, in the, in the period that, that Jason is talking about, there's a dramatic increase in government's closing records, uh, the local level, the state level. Uh, there, there's, there's no doubt there's a whole different mindset in government officials now who think these are their records and not your records. So he, Jason's absolutely right in saying these, these, uh, these complaints are increasing, because, not because somebody's doing a better job enforcing it, but because there's more offenders out there. So um, we already have several questions from uh, members of the audience. And before I get to them, I want to ask Gene Manneke a question. Since we're talking now about Missouri and we have a representative from the Missouri Attorney General's office. And because uh, I myself uh, dealt with a lot of these issues when I was a practicing journalist, um, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't ask this question. So. Uh, and again, this has nothing whatsoever to do with our panelists, but um, I want to ask Jean about what she thinks uh, about Missouri's record of compliance with its own sunshine law. And, you know, I'm thinking back when Josh Hawley, now Senator Hawley, was Attorney General of the state of Missouri. His staff, and you know, this was widely uh, publicized in newspaper uh, accounts, his staff began using private email accounts instead of government-issued uh, addresses that are subject to the Sunshine Law to discuss public business with out-of-state political consultants. And that was uh, quite scandalous. And um, then, again, by way of backdrop to my question to Gene, um, and, and Jason touched upon this. As of a few months ago, there was a backlog of, I believe, nearly 300 public records requests pending in the attorney general's office, including more than 200 that the current AG, uh, Andrew Bailey, inherited from his predecessor, the uh, now uh, U.S. Senator Eric Schmidt. So, And some people have waited for more than a year to get responses to their requests. So, um, Gene... Could you, you know, give us a 30,000 foot view, as it were, uh, of uh, how you see Missouri complying with its own Sunshine Law? Dan, I think your question um, actually segues right into something Bernie said that I was thinking about that I want to add to what Bernie was saying. There is a whole change in public perception about privacy. Um, on one hand, there's people like those of you who are interested in the Sunshine Law who strongly believe that you have a right to know how your government spends its money, why it makes the decisions it makes. And then on the other side, we've got a large group of public officials who are very afraid for their safety. Um, they, they're afraid for people to know where they live. Uh, we no longer have access to the addresses of judges in the state of Missouri. Law enforcement officers don't want you knowing if they live within the city limits. And, and that, uh, you know, I, I understand that concern. Right? Heavens, we all have seen plenty of violence in my, here in this neighborhood. But, but that, that is not the, the answer to, to start blocking access to all this information. You have a right to know who your government officials are, where they live. Uh, they run for public office, so they have to declare that they're in your jurisdiction. You have a right to know how your tax dollars are being spent and why the, the budget needs to increase, whether there's money going out of the budget to people who shouldn't be getting money, because there are inevitably situations where people are getting access to public funds that really have no right to have access to it. Um, when I get phone calls, I tell a lot of people who can't afford, just like Bernie said, can't afford a lawyer, I tell them to call the attorney general's office. That's their only remedy. 
And I just uh, today was reading an article that um, is in the AP, the Associated Press feed, where they've done a survey of all 50 states and what you have access to, how, how the laws are working. And the, one of the conclusions in that article was it's not right that people have to hire a lawyer in order to get access to their government information. And Dean raised a really good point and to segue to something, Stan, that you had mentioned yeah. in your opening. You know, every state has a Sunshine Law equivalent, right? Missouri just recently celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Sunshine Law, one of the first states to have a statutorily codified open records, open, because it covers open meetings too, so open meetings of local governmental entities. Every state now has one. The federal government has one, FOIA. And uh, I think Missouri is an interesting case study because it was one of those first states to have a foundational groundbreaking law, but hasn't been amended a whole lot. There's been tweaks here and there, right? But a lot of what you see in the Sunshine Law is from the early to mid 70s, right? But as we know, the 21st century has really revolutionized the way that business is conducted and, and emails and whatnot. But contrasting Missouri to at least two of the neighbors. So we have Kansas on one side, we have Illinois on another. Illinois is my home state. And just recently, uh, my, my mom actually was seeking records from the Illinois Department of Health and Senior Services. My aunt is in an assisted living facility, Medicaid patient. And uh, there was an, an incident. We were trying to figure out what happened, what the investigation was. It was like pulling teeth hmm. to get records. Um, not sure if it was quite what Bernie and his client went through, but it, <laughs> there are some similarities that you know make, make you kind of wonder. And then, uh, but the interesting thing about both Illinois and Kansas, so Gene and Bernie both touched on. They're private attorneys. They can sometimes help uh, if you have the right client that can maybe, you know, afford to put a private attorney's bill in the attorney general's office. You know, we could bring a lawsuit as well on behalf of the public to vindicate the public interest. But the remedy is courts. A lot of what Missouri Sunshine Law is, you have the text of the statute, but a lot of it is what courts have interpreted to be. There's a lot of judicial opinions. Unless you have a law degree, it can be really hard to find those opinions and even figure out what they mean. Lawyers even wrestle about what these opinions mean. Illinois and Kansas, there's a stopping point. And Dan, you might know this a little bit from Kansas or any of you that work in Illinois. The Kansas Attorney General's Office and the Illinois Attorney General's Office have sort of this administrative remedy process where those state attorney generals can do a little bit more of an investigation. They have a little bit more power to do an investigation. Mm -hmm. And in Illinois, I don't know if Kansas is true, but Illinois at least can't even find. So before you get to courts, it's kind of like if you have a property tax appeal, right? And you can go through the process and maybe, you know, get something back from the government. You don't always need an attorney. But in Illinois, there's this process set forward where if you're requesting records from a state or local entity, you appeal to the, to the Illinois Attorney General's office who can look at this, decide it, maybe even find the entity. In Missouri, our law just doesn't have this, right? So the remedy is private attorney or come to the attorney general's office yep. and you know we do our best with the limited staff we have um, and you go to court over it. So there's sort of this lack of, a relative lack comparatively of you know these other, other avenues to help enforce a sunshine law that our neighboring states right. often do have. Uh, to give due credit to the state of Missouri, by the way, uh, Jason is absolutely right that it was one of the earlier states to adopt an open records law in the same way that Missouri was one of the earliest states to adopt a nonpartisan court plan that entailed uh, the appointment of judges on a nonpartisan basis, uh, a plan that has been duplicated by many states across the nation. So one can, could possibly question the trajectory of uh, where Missouri has gone over the years with respect to both those laws. Um, but it's worth noting that Missouri was once a pioneer in this sphere. So we have, it appears, more questions than we have people here today. And uh, so I don't want to shortchange you folks because apparently uh, you have a lot of questions. So I'm going to uh, start off with a couple, and uh, this one is specifically directed to Bernie. And right, go, go ahead. And the questioner, <laughs> the questioner asks, 
Can Mr. Rhodes explain the importance of the Sunshine Law case filed by, uh, and I may be misreading this name, case filed by Jason Mackey? May is that right? Mackey? I think it's Mackey. Mackey, a Parkville citizen. And the questioner says, I'm a reporter who has interviewed Mr. Rhodes, uh, extensively covered this case for a small newspaper in Platte County. And since she signed her name, I'll, I'll say it. Is that okay? Can I say your name? Yeah. Yes? She's online. Okay. Oh, Debbie Coleman Toppy. Topi, thank you. So, yes, Bernie? This is another great example where a local citizen on his own fought with the folks up in Parkville and, and brought this suit, uh, again, was faced with lawyers making all kinds of objections, and motions to try to throw the case out, and, uh, and, and eventually prevailed. Because as, as Jason said, we, we have a good law here if we would only enforce it. It's like these people who talk about gun control. We don't need more gun laws. We need to enforce the ones we have. We could talk about whether whether Jason's got a good idea of adopting the, the Illinois procedure. But we the problem is we don't enforce the laws we have, uh, you know, unless you get a, a, a lawyer like Gene or I, or if you're like Jason, you want to you want to pursue it yourself. I mean, the problem is there's this there's the, there's just this lackadaisical attitude that the Sunshine Law is really no longer important. I don't want to let a big secret out of the bag, but but the four of us had a call before the presentation so we could kind of get our stuff together. And we talked about the fact that there is this backlog at the Missouri Attorney General's office. And, you know, we were, Jason was very gracious in agreeing to come, even though we knew we were going to talk about it. So I, I want to do a good job. I don't want to exaggerate the problem. So what happened? I made a Missouri Sunshine Law request to the Missouri Attorney General for a list of the pending Sunshine Law requests in their office. Hmm. As a meta request. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that what you should do if you want to get this? I got, I got a nice form letter back saying we will, the earliest that we could provide you with the list is July 10th. Hmm. The Missouri Sunshine Law says you have to act upon a request within three days at the latest, right away if it's available. I find it difficult to believe that the custodian of records who sent this and who assigned a number to it, 24-101, suggests to me that there's a database <laughs> that each request goes into that it's really going to take her until July to access the database and send me a list. The, the problem is that they don't have enough people. They, you know, they, they have, well, if it's 24 101, <laughs> I think that means that I'm the 101st request this year. And if I'm not going to get the request until July, that's four months. So they're still working on December and November requests. <laughs> And we could argue about how smart it is that they, they're, they're going in sequential order. It would be like if you have an open heart surgery scheduled and I need to have a, a splinter taken out, I can't go to the doctor and have my splinter taken out until you have your open heart surgery. So they're, they're putting them all in sequential order. So the big ones cause everybody to back up. But it just reflects, again, the problem that we have that the Sunshine Law is not important. The mm. People in government do not think it's important to keep us informed because they're in office and they want to stay in office. That last part was an editorial comment. Yeah, there's one yes. other thing we need to add to what Bernie was talking, though, about the class kid. That is the only instance I know of where a court has awarded a private citizen attorney's fees. The court, at the end of the case, uh, he won. The court said, if, if you had had counsel, you'd be entitled to your attorney's fees. So we're going to give you a sum of money to represent what you would have spent. 
I find that incredible. That's an amazing twist of the way the case is. Yeah, you know, the money thing is interesting. It goes back to the question about um, the requester, Mr. Maki, from the, the Parkville area. And I, there are a lot of interesting issues with this case. I just followed it as, as to being a normal member of the public, right? But it was a private citizen lawsuit. And, um, you know, one thing that some governmental bodies do is the Sunshine Law does authorize a governmental body to charge fees. And, uh, you know, Barney had a one and a one and a half, was it, from Reclaim the Rugby? Yes, one and one a half, half million. Million dollar fee. And if uh, memory served, I think Park Bill, it wasn't a million, but there was, it was some, pretty. It was pretty high. It was pretty yeah. high for the requester in, in that situation. And, um, you know, unless you call Gene or you call Bernie or you call the attorney general's office, a lot of citizens just get flustered and they say, it's not worth my time or you don't have the money, you know, to pay who has one and a half million dollars, anyway, <laughs> right? You know, to pay that kind of money. But you know, effectively, when a governmental body is charging that amount of money, maybe it's proportional, maybe it's not proportional. A lot of citizens give up. And yeah. then what happens? The governmental body doesn't begin processing it because a citizen gave up. They said, oh, don't worry about it, or they don't get back to the governmental body. So they just stop. Now, in the attorney general's office, we, we don't charge anyone anything for money, free. Everything's free from our office. It's been this way for years and years and years, which means that when we get records requests, it takes a while because we don't have people dropping out of the queue, right? Because there's no money being charged. We believe in transparency. It takes time. And, you know, when you have new people take off this, you realize that uh, you, you know, have a difficult inherited situation of 200, almost 300 records requests from other administrations that you try to plow through and not charge money, it means that, uh, you know, decisions have to be made. You know, do you maybe take the, you know, smaller ones first, but then if you always take the smaller ones first, you never get to the ones where there's 80,000 responsive records. And it takes, trust me, it takes a long time to go through 80,000 documents, especially when you're not charging fees. So everyone is, every request is being touched, whereas some entities, like I think the Parkville case, if memory serves, there is a high amount, and when you get charged that high amount, reports be charged a high amount, you might just not pursue it and give up. And uh, that kind of, if you're the governmental entity that dwindles the number of requests you respond to, but if you're not charging one, anyone anything, uh, you know, on the one hand, yes, everyone's getting their records for free. That's great for transparency. This might take a little bit longer sometimes to process through, through mm -hmm. all that. So those are the, I think, decisions. And for citizens, you know, that are faced with those tens of thousands of dollars of fees. Um, and the only remedy is the courts. Even that's a barrier to get to the court systems for those fee issues. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, one of the questions uh, that a member of the audience is asking pertains to what I was talking about uh, during Josh Hawley's tenure uh, as Missouri Attorney General. And the question is, and uh, Gene, if you want to take this on first, um, what is the status of open records regarding messaging apps like Confide, which, you know, self-destruct after a certain uh, designated period of time? And uh, uh, the uh, questioner says an appeals court found that the use of that app was not illegal, at least uh, this was, again, when Greitens was uh, Eric Brightens was governor of Missouri. Can you, what, so what is the status of uh, uh, when it comes to messaging apps, whether they are subject to the Sunshine Law? Well, unfortunately you're right. There's not a clear court decision on that. And I just the other day had a phone call from someone who says it's happening again. And I won't go into the details because I don't want to disclose what's going on. But but we're not done with that issue, and um, we need we need the courts to say that's not right because the the whole focus of this goes back to the the definition: a public record is a record retained by the public body. And so, if the record isn't retained. They can say, no, not a public record. We don't have to disclose it. And yet there, that information is the basis for decisions being made and the, the history of how something happened. And so that information needs to be there. Um, and uh, you, you mentioned um, 
Josh Hawley, and I, I don't want to talk much about Mr. Hawley, but, but I will give him one bit of credit. Um, at the time he was in the Attorney General's office, he worked very hard with the Missouri Press Association to try to create a position. To, it had go through the legislature to create a position that we were going to call the Public Records Council. There is a uh, public council for uh, utility companies, and this could be very similar to that. It doesn't have to be in the AG's office. It could be in the Secretary of State's office. It could be other places. Um, at that point in time, the fiscal note became a problem. You know, every bill that goes through has a fiscal note. What's this going to cost the state? And that, that was one of the hindrances in getting it passed. And then he went off to Washington. Uh, so, to your knowledge, does any other state have such oh, a? Yes. Mm -hmm. like I think Kansas has something similar. Uh -huh. Okay, right at the yeah. states too. Interesting. Wow. Uh, and and you know if that uh, is still actively uh, being? No. Every bill in Missouri is dead at the end of the session, right. and there has not been one introduced uh, in that vein since. Uh, um, another question from the audience. And uh, this, uh, I'll direct it to you, Jason, first, and then to Bernie. How well trained are those, I, well, the questioners put it, who hold public records? I think perhaps he or she meant how well trained are those who are called upon to respond to public records requests? At least that's the way I interpret the question. Am I getting it right, whoever asked that question? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to take a first stab at that answer. You know, Missouri uh, has a lot of counties for a state our size, 115, if I remember right, local county level and the city of St. Louis as an independent entity. A lot of counties and a whole lot of cities as well. Um, you know, when we receive complaints from the public and we, you know, meet on a regular basis to go over who are the complaints against, what should we do about the matter? And often there's cities we've never heard of before. And right now we have a complaint against a city of 75 people, hmm. 75 people that are trying to run a, in a small village on, on their own. Um, city's been around for a long time. Uh, so you have entities like this where there might not be the same level of training or sophistication if you know, everyone lives on the same block and that's your town. Uh, you know, you just might not have that built in. And some of these cities or even some counties might have part-time records custodians where just the, the virtue of their position, it's 15, 20 hours a week. They have to be the city clerk, uh, run elections. They need to help the courts. Uh, they need to help the streets and they need to respond to records requests all in 20 hours a week. And then you have some entities like the city of Kansas City which has probably more of a robust system, at least, of multiple people responding. There is an online system to submit uh, records requests. Dan, you might be familiar, familiar with that. Um, so there is a, a large discrepancy and disparity. You know, one thing that we try to do, at least in the attorney general's office, is to get out there. And uh, under our current administration, Andrew Bailey's made it a big priority to increase our training, increase our education of the Sunshine Line. Last year, we had a record, an uh, office record number of trainings that we conduct, not only to members of the public, but also to custodians of records at counties and cities and state agencies as well. And this year, we're hoping to set another record, but there's always more to do out there. There's just a big gap given how Missouri is structured with cities as small as 75 people to cities as big as hundreds of thousands. And mm. you're going to get a big education gap, often based on how big your, your locality is. Mm. And then you have the example of uh, uh, officials uh, like the one Bernie was describing earlier, in that case, a former official who seemed to be uh, work to actively subvert uh, in the, uh, the Sunshine Law. How often do you encounter that, Bernie? Uh, more than you would think. <laughs> Again, because there's become this, this entitlement to office. And this questioning of anyone who questions them. I mean, it is, believe it or not, I used to have hair. <laughs> I don't remember that. I, I, yeah, you remember <laughs> that, Dan. You remember that. Uh, I, I can't describe to you enough the attitude of so many, not all. I, I, don't, I don't want to paint with too broad a brush. Not all, but so many public officials 
who simply view it as not any of my or my client's business or information. And, and as we talked earlier with Jason's discussion of the complaints, this is a this is a growing problem. This is not a problem that's going away. This is a problem that's becoming worse with with literally every day. Hmm. So I want to uh, bring up the uh, case of some uh, legislation that was enacted under the cover of night, so to speak. It wasn't debated at all in the Missouri legislature. And I want to ask all three panelists about what they make of this law. And it is a law that requires the names of victims and witnesses to be deleted from court documents. And um, the Missouri Press Bar Commission told the Missouri Supreme Court, which oversees all of the state's courts, that it had serious concerns about the legality and constitutional constitutionality of that law. So I want to ask all three of you, is that a big deal or is the law merely meant uh, to ensure that there's a proper balance between public disclosure and privacy considerations? I can say before you, you respond that as a reporter, I would have been appalled and absolutely, uh, you know, it, it just would have made my life hellish to not be able to pursue uh, the leads that would have been provided by names that are in court documents. I mean, it, 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 would, uh, it would cause so many stories that otherwise would come to light not to come to light. So what do you make of that law? This Anybody? is a solution in need of a problem. Mm. Uh, there, there are proper mechanisms out there now to close certain records which deserve to be closed. But, but this across-the-board approach is just draconian. And, I mean, I would literally give you an example. Friday evening, about 10 o'clock, I got a call from a, uh, a client, a business, not, not, in, the, not in the news business, uh, a client who there were some social media posts about that the client assured me were not true. And so I spent the weekend trying to figure out who these posts came from, investigating the veracity of them. And I am not exaggerating. A good half of the time I spent researching was reviewing court records, looking and, and eventually identified who these posters were through court records. I couldn't have done that. I, I mean, that's just an example. Again, it has nothing to do with journalism. It has nothing to do with news media. But it's the availability of records to further information. And none of, the, you know, none of these folks whose names that I reviewed and all of these records have any unique privacy rights. You know, they're involved in a lawsuit. If somebody sues me, people have. He, we, I, I'm a big fancy... LLP now, a limited legal partnership or something. I don't even know what it was. But back in the old days, we were just a plain old partnership. You know how you sue a partnership? You sue all the partners. <laughs> so, I mean, I used to get sued all the time. Every time my law firm would get sued, I'd get named along with all my other partners. Uh, you know, I shouldn't be able to say, oh, you can't do that. You know, nobody's entitled to know that. Yes, of course, they're entitled to know that. Um, so, yeah, again, it's it's a solution looking for a problem in my mind. Chief? Well, um, let me say first that I sit on the Missouri Press Bar Commission. And uh, we, we as a commission are more concerned about this issue, but I don't think it's a legislative, 100% uh, a legislative issue. I don't think it's a sunshine light issue. My understanding is that all this arises out of CaseNet, the computerized database of court cases in Missouri. Um, there was a strong push that we make that available to the public, not just to reporters. It's been available to reporters for some time. And it is, it is available at the courthouse, but they wanted John Q. Citizen to be able to sit at home get on CaseNet and look up the kind of stuff Bernie looked up, although Bernie has more access than the citizens do. 
So OSCA, Office of State Courts Administration, came up with the rules that they wanted in order to open CaseNet up to everybody. And they preferred those rules to the legislature and said, we want you to do this because we've got so much information out there that social security numbers are in CaseNet. We've got to find a way to limit what is available to the public if we're going to open this up. And the biggest issue to cut to the chase has been probable cause statements. When somebody is arrested, there is a law enforcement record that says, uh, we have evidence based on our investigation that this happened to this victim. These people are the possible suspects. These are the possible witnesses. Here's where it happened, when it happened. That's all in the probable cause statement. And reporters have used those for years to write stories. And that we've got to close that kind of information. We can't have that available to the public. Or how would we ever get a jury? I, I think it was what they were thinking. So, so those court records got closed. And a lot of people are very upset about not being able to get that information. Just uh, last week, I wrote about what happened down here with the shooting at Union Station. There were uh, people who were involved in the shooting. Reporters couldn't find out anything about what happened, what caused this to happen. It took almost a week before we finally found out the two guys were pulling guns on each other and shooting each other. That information wasn't available. No one could get it. And then there's the poor guy who didn't leave the area fast enough and law enforcement set him down, said to him, you're under arrest, you sit there. I think he was even photographed in handcuffs. Mm -hmm. That picture went out on social media. A few of our rather smart alecky legislators of a certain bent decided that meant he was guilty and after all, he was an illegal alien. And so they just blasted him in social media. This poor guy had done nothing. He's not an illegal alien. And so that's the kind of problems that we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. uh, I, don't, I don't have an answer to your question. Right. I do think that the legislature... Well, you know, but it's interesting because this information was always available on CaseNet, but as you say, the, the people who were privy to it were largely lawyers. And you know, for instance, because I had a law license, I was able to get on CaseNet on behalf of my colleagues at KCUR, say, and uh, look up all these court cases. I was also the one, I will confess, who whenever I'd meet with the Missouri Supreme Court uh, judges who were in charge of the whole case net system, urged them to open it up to the public at large. Uh, similar electronic court filing systems in other states are open to the public at large. I didn't see any reason why attorneys should be the only ones who had access to these records. And as Gene points out, that's actually not the case. Uh, you as a private citizen also had access to these records, albeit you had to go down to the courthouse to access them and use the computers at the courthouse as opposed to your laptop at home or your PC at home. So those records were always available, but I think now the concern was now that, you know, the great unwashed were gonna have these records you know, that they could just look up anywhere, anytime. Now, uh, they looked at it differently, um, but shouldn't the same principle apply? Jason, well, Jason or Jean, go ahead. Well, let me just yeah. one more thought. I do think that there will be changes made in case now and access to information this legislative session. Mm -hmm. Some of this okay. Jason. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't have anything else uh, further to add um you know like anything there's competing interests at play and right. you know for what it's worth case net was a pioneering system when it was developed about 20 25 years yeah. ago and you know sometimes i'll need to research other state courts for for you know my job and it is not easy to navigate other states courts websites some are pretty good and others yeah. are uh, maybe not so not so good but um yeah i think gene's probably you know right i think the read of the room right now is that 
the Missouri Supreme Court wanted to you know, take some effort to um, protect, uh, you know, confidential informants or witnesses and maybe, uh, you know, for understandable reasons, didn't want their name, you know, in public. But it's a it's a new rule. And I think the read on the room is probably there might be some revision to it by by statute or court rule mm-hmm. at some point. Uh, but I don't I'm not privy to any intel okay. on if or when on the scope of what that might be. Right. Uh, Gene was talking about. Uh, probable cause affidavits, which are a great source of information for journalists. And we have a really remarkable case that I'm sure all of you have heard of because it made national, indeed, international news uh, about a year ago. uh, And it concerned a probable cause affidavit. And I'm talking about a case that Bernie is directly involved with. And uh, it's Uh, the case of the uh, then police chief of the small town of Marion, Kansas, who led raids uh, on the newspaper there, a weekly newspaper called the Marion County Record, and also raids on the home of its publisher and editor and the home of a Marion, uh, Marion City Councilwoman. And the search warrants in the case were based on the police chief's claim that he had probable cause to investigate the supposed identity theft of a Marion small business owner named Carrie Newell. And in applying for the search warrants, the police chief, the then police chief, wrote that he was investigating a reporter who looked up Newell's driver's license records, which, by the way, were public records on a state database. Now, information later emerged that the police chief had asked a witness to delete text messages. And through a Kansas Open Records Act request, the newspaper was able to obtain body cam footage showing the police chief rifling through the Marion County record, that's the newspaper, through its files on him because it turned out those files included the identity of a confidential source who told the newspaper about the disciplinary problems this police chief had faced when he was a police officer in Kansas City, Missouri. So Bernie, you represent the paper. What can you tell us about that case and how, if Cora didn't exist, things might have turned out differently? Absolutely would have turned out differently from, from, the, from the very beginning. So what happened was the newspaper had received a confidential tip, so. things that newspapers get every day, that an uh, influential local business person, Carrie Newell is her name, uh, and it had applied for a catering license to serve liquor that she, in fact, didn't have a driver's license because she had a DUI convictions and couldn't was ineligible to get a driver's license because she hadn't done all the things she needed to do. Well, the first thing they teach you in journalism school is verify the information. Uh, So so a reporter took this tip. The the, the tipster had provided literally a copy of a letter that the Kansas Department of Revenue had sent to Carrie Newell. So the tipster did something that you probably have never considered Googled Kansas driver's license (coughs) status check and was directed to the Kansas Department of Revenue online driver's license status tool. There's no login. There's no password. You don't have to pat your stomach and rub your head. (laughs) You don't have to do anything except put in the information right from the letter. Carrie Newell's first name, her last name, her address, and her driver's license number. And she did that and clicked through the document that said, I'm doing this for a legal purpose. I'm not going to go extort Carrie Newell. I'm not going to go stalk Carrie Newell. And literally the first document that showed up was a copy of the very letter that the tipster gave. And then in what the chief claims was some cabal, the editor of the paper sends an email to the chief and the county sheriff saying, we got this letter about this local business person. 
it's hard to think there was some big secret here when it was the chief who let them know about the letter. It all led to this raid on a Friday uh, of the newspaper and of the home of the newspaper's 98-year-old owner and her 70-year-old son, who had moved back to Marion, Kansas in the middle of COVID to take care of his mother. And, so to, and to, to be editor of the newspaper. Yeah, right? to be yeah. editor of the newspaper. He was, yeah. he was teaching journalism at the University yeah. of Illinois. But because of COVID, she was there by herself. His, his father passed away some time ago. He moved back, became editor, moved in with her. And uh, the police raided the newspaper. Police raided the home. I'm, I, I hope you've all seen the video of uh, of the mother telling the police where to go. <laughs> and, and and I knew nothing about it. Uh, I, I, I'll i be the first to admit, perhaps I'm a terrible person. I'd never heard of Marion Kansas. <laughs> I first got an email about eight o'clock that night from somebody at the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press asking me if I could help. I said, well, yeah, tell me where Marion is. <laughs> And we finally made arrangements that I would call the editor, Eric, at his mother's house at 10 p.m. that night because she had a landline. Because the police had taken his cell phone. Police had taken all the computers at the home. Police had taken the computers at the newspaper. The, literally the only way to talk to somebody in 2023 was on a landline. So I call him. We have a we had a very good discussion. He's explaining what's happening, and I'm like, "Really, really?" He's explaining. I can't send him an email because the the computer server has all their email. So so I need to send any emails to him to his old address from when he was teaching at Illinois because the email was still valid. So we could go on a neighbor's computer and access his web mail. And he's explaining that it's E.K. Meyer at Illinois.edu. And I hear this voice. Now, Eric, tell the young man he doesn't have to use a capital I <laughs> in Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> She's proofreading <laughs> at 1030 at night. And she's dead the next day. Yeah. It was my one and only interaction with her, but as you can tell, it had an effect on me. And it all started from accessing public records to do a reporter's job. Mm. And as Dan said, the, the public records aspect has, has continued. The When this officer, this police chief, Gideon Cody is named, he was making $150,000 a year as a captain here in Kansas City. He left that job to take a $70,000 a year job in the middle of nowhere. And by the middle of nowhere, I mean a town that is so small, it literally does not have a stoplight. And as soon as he was announced as a candidate, the newspaper down there started getting all kinds of calls and from people in Kansas City telling about all the problems. Gideon Cody had literally driven over a, a dead body at a crime scene. He had made all kinds of inappropriate, disparaging comments about female subordinates. He had uh, referred to another male officer who wouldn't kick in a door because the officer didn't think it was appropriate as a coward, forced him to leave. So the paper had all these complaints about him. And once this incident occurred, one of the things... You know, I don't only send open records requests to Missouri Attorney General. We sent a Kansas Open Rec Records Request Act to the police department for all of the body cam footage. And there is this absolutely remarkable footage of a police officer looking through the desk drawer of a reporter who had been the one reporting on these tips about the officer. And he closes the drawer. And you don't think anything of it at the time. He doesn't take anything out. You would think nothing. A few minutes later, the police chief comes in. And the officer who had just gone through the door says to the police chief, all on body camera footage we got because of the Kansas Open Records Act. The officer says to the chief, 
do you want to look through this drawer? And the chief says, well, you could look through it. The officer says, I know. Do you mm -hmm. want to look through this drawer? You'll understand. The chief goes up and opens the door, opens the drawer and says, the file on me. <laughs> That's what we talk about holding government officials accountable. Without that body camera footage, we could not prove that that's part of what the raid was about. But now we've got that. Interestingly enough, the chief who had a body camera, a body camera and who left the body camera on between raids when he went to Casey's to relieve himself, <laughs> somehow remarkably turned it off when he was looking through the desk drawer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the other officer had his on. And that's why we have this entire conversation. That's why we need things like the Sunshine Law and the Kansas Open Rec Record Act and the Freedom of Information Act, right. because people like Gideon Cody need to be held accountable. Right. And th that's a real world example yeah. of how that works. There is a silver lining to this otherwise appalling abuse of governmental power. And that is that the circulation of the paper as a result of all the publicity attended upon this case, uh, I think tripled or quadrupled. I mean, people were subscribing just as a show of support from all over the world. So, I mean, I'm sure uh, if the editor had his druthers, the incident would not have happened. And he might still have his 98-year-old mother with him today. She, as Bernie pointed out, she died of a heart attack the following day, no doubt, at least in part occasioned by the stress uh, of uh, what happened. But there is that silver lining. We are running out of time, and I don't want to give short shrift. We have many other questions from the audience, so I'm going to try uh, just a couple before we uh, wind up and ask perhaps our panelists to give uh, some kind of uh, peroration on the value and importance of uh, sunshine laws, and then we'll uh, we'll call it a day or a night. So uh, this question: When we observe cities, school boards, um, library boards, etc., it sometimes seems all decisions have been made before the meeting takes place. There is no discussion, just votes. So. The uh, questioner asks, how are private emails considered uh, between board members? I gather with he or she is asking, with, uh, are they uh, accessible under the uh, open records laws? Anybody want to try that? Sure, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, Dan's question raises a few interesting questions. I'll be as brief as I can about uh, each issue that I kind of spotted with, uh, with a series of questions. Uh, you know, the first is this concept of a free meeting, right, where you might attend a local city council or county commission, and yeah, it seems like this should be an important issue, and there's 10 seconds of discussion and a vote. You know, what happens? And, uh, you know, I think the, the lawyers on the panel, there's a, there's a few cases that, um, you know, have held on the one hand that, if it's maybe you have a, a group of five people on a board and that's, uh, you know, and, and Gene and Bernie, only Gene and Bernie get together and they talk about what they want to do. But it's only the two of them, but there's five people on the board. They're not a majority. So you have that kind of line of the sunshine law where, you know, when two people have a discussion and it's not a quorum, you didn't really have a majority do anything. But if you have a situation where it's Gene and Bernie have one meeting, and Gene and Jason have another, and then Jason and Bernie have a meeting, and then together it kind of looks like you're staging something beforehand. That sound walks like a sunshine law violation, talks like a sunshine law violation, and I think that kind of gets the spirit of the sunshine law. And you know that that could be a concern if you're really discussing this one on one. You know, I think these the group emails back and forth and, and what can be a meeting, what can't be a meeting. Very little case for Missouri in right now. And that's what I was alluding to earlier. The Sun Prime Law was written and a bulk of the text was from the mid-70s, late 70s, hasn't really been touched a whole lot since. Uh, the Sunshine Law has one provision about emails, but 
uh, you really had to kind of look to see what the definition of a public record is and is it retained, is it not retained, and is the governmental entity doing something to avoid it to begin with? Like if you know, Bernie and I have a meeting, then then me and Dean, then me and Bernie, then that could look like you're getting close to some kind of violation. I think those are the issues. Mm -hmm. I think we're all looking for some some maybe guidance from the courts on a few of those interesting issues. Mm. Um, you know, when we were having our little prep meeting the other day, I guess, was that yesterday or the day before over Zoom, uh, Jason pointed out a case to me that I was unfamiliar with because it only came down a few weeks ago from the Missouri Court of Appeals in Kansas City. And before uh, concluding our discussion this evening, I'd just like to ask him a question about it. And as the other two panelists are familiar with it, uh, to weigh in as well. Um, so a St. Louis lawyer named Mark Pedroli had sought to have uh, Missouri House of Representative Rule 127 declared unconstitutional uh, and that in enacting it, the House had violated the Sunshine Law. So what is this rule? It was enacted in 2019. And it allows members to keep constituent case files and caucus strategy records confidential. It's more complicated than that, but uh, that's a brief summation of the law. And constituent case files include any written or electronic correspondence between a member and a constituent, a member of the House and a constituent. So in its decision just a couple of weeks ago, uh, two, or even more recently than that, two of the uh, three judges found that Mr. Pedroli did not have standing to bring the case because, if I read the decision correctly, he individually was not adversely affected by House Rule 127. But I am more interested, and Jason, I'm directing this to you in particular, uh, in the dissent filed by Judge Alok Ahuja, who I believe used to be Bernie's partner right. before he was appointed to the bench what, 15 or so years ago, maybe more than that. Uh, he, in his dissent, said he would have found that Pedroli did have standing because he is the one who actually made the Sunshine Law requested issue and therefore was an aggrieved person, quote unquote, under the Sunshine Law. And two, he'd established that he was a citizen of the state under the Sunshine Law, which is a prerequisite for standing because he showed that he was a Missouri resident and business owner and a Missouri licensed lawyer practicing in Missouri. So Judge Ahuja then went on to uh, address the merits of the case. And he said that House Rule 127, in his opinion, is unconstitutional. So what do you make of that? Yeah, sure, Dan. Happy to take this one. And uh, you know, to be clear, this is not legal advice, and the Attorney General's office was right. not involved. Was not right. involved in this one. So, yeah, uh, this is you know, just my kind of high-level thoughts, if anything. And the Sunshine Law grants a, a citizen the right to sue. Right, in order to sue, you have to be personally affected by an issue. And in this particular lawsuit, um, the, the attorney submitted a records request on behalf of. You know, he actually submitted it in his own name. Uh, I'll need to read the opinion again, but right. what he came down to is the party that sued, so plaintiff versus defendant. The plaintiff wasn't the person that submitted the sunshine request, was my reading of this. And I think that's why the Court of Appeals... It was actually his law firm. His law firm. Well, yes, right. so, I mean, right. a, a distinction without a difference in my view, and that's what I think Judge yeah, uh, Huja... Yeah, yeah. Is, you know, let's look past the formalities of the lawsuit. Right was a citizen, maybe there wasn't, but, uh, you know, the case will live on. So as Dan mentioned, the case came down just what, early last week, I believe. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know, but they have an option to go to the Missouri Supreme Court and see if the Supreme Court wants to take this one up. But if the Supreme Court doesn't take it up, it doesn't have to, it, it might or might not. Right. I have to that one. Yeah. Uh, but the Court of Appeals opinion said, we're sending this back down to the circuit court to dismiss it without prejudice, which means that there could be an opportunity, perhaps, for, for him to just fix the petition. Right, for the plaintiff to amend his petition, right. 
Yeah. Perhaps the case might live on, whether this iteration of it or a future one. Okay. Right. If we had more time, which we don't, I uh, I would have liked to pursue this Rule 127, which is very interesting unto itself. But let, let us conclude the evening uh, by asking, I'll ask a question that one of the questioners uh, posed you know, on these index cards. And uh, that is, so we discussed how Missouri was one of the first states to enact an open records law. And over time, it, it would seem that much of what that law sought to do has, you know, uh, been thwarted, shall we say, if, if not the letter of the law, then the spirit of the law. So what can be done to improve that law, which somebody noted on the panel, hasn't really uh, been amended in a long, long time, especially to address uh, considerations that didn't exist at the time it was first enacted, namely <laughs> online, uh, you know, the internet and social media. Sure. Um, I, I will take the position that the Sunshine Law has been amended many times since it was enacted originally. Um, it, it got better and, and during the 80s, during the early 90s, it got better. And then in the last 10, 15, 20 years, it's gotten worse. There are more exceptions. There are um, rights of access that have been removed. And a lot of that has to do with um, who's in the legislature. Although I will say that in that period of the 1980s, 1990s, the Republicans took the leading role in getting amendments passed that were good. So it, I can't say it's the Republicans because that's not true. Um, but there have been a lot of changes made to the law. Uh, every year there's more exceptions and there's benefits and privileges taken out of it. We need as citizens to show our legislators that this is an important law for us, that we are harmed by not having these rights and we need to, to make sure they understand that because they're hearing, as I started out saying, they're hearing from people that say, my information is out there on the internet and I don't want anybody to have it. And so we've got to close access to my information. That's what they hear more than they hear from people who say, we need access. <clears throat> I'll just make a, a, a quick note. Um, you know, what can we do to, to Dan's question? Uh, education, right? Going to events like this, calling your legislature, go to Sunshine Law Training's offices, call your public official, call the AU's office, talk to other members um, that know about the Sunshine Law. You know, we but violations can often be cured with more, more sophistication, more education. That's what we're trying to do is get the word out about the Sunshine Law. It's a critical tool. It's a great tool. Taking a step back, globally speaking, nationally speaking, the Missouri Sunshine Law uh, is very short. If you look at the Illinois equivalent, yeah. very long federal yeah. FOIA. Uh, good luck. I mean, I don't think it's very long. So the Missouri Sunshine Law is more understandable by looking at it. Uh, but you know, there's a lot of room for education out there, and you know, comparatively, Missouri. Uh, there's a lot more open here in, in many ways than there is in other states. It, it is a great tool, can always be improved. And I think uh, you know, to remedy some violations out there, start with education. You know, tell if you find a sunshine law violation, file a complaint, uh, talk to your city council, talk to your county commission. If that's where it's happening, bring it to their attention and make sure that uh, there's always education and training out there. And we're always happy to help. Bernie, you have the last word. I'll, I'll take education a step further and, and commend what the league does. We need to educate voters. As, as Gene says, it's not, it's not a Republican Democratic issue. It's, a, it's the idea of elected officials who understand who their constituents are. We need to elect people who, I mean, I have clients. The idea that I'm not going to tell my client if I lose some motion unless they call and ask me. <laughs> I wouldn't have clients for long. You are the clients of those folks in Jefferson City. They should be reaching out to tell you information. They should be making their information available to you. And if not, we need to throw the bums out. 
<laughs> um, I should point out that there are very useful pamphlets uh, available for everybody to take uh, from the Missouri Attorney General's office about Missouri Sunshine Law. Um, so feel free to pick one up on your way out this evening. I want to thank all three of our panelists. I think we can all agree that this has been an, an enlightening evening. And uh, I thank you, uh, especially Jason. He traveled all the way across the state from St. Louis to come here this evening. So we appreciate that. And of course, as always, my gratitude to my old uh, defense counsel and my old colleague, Gene Manneke and Bernie Rhodes. Can we uh, have a, a round of applause? Thank you. And I would like to, of course, include uh, Dan Margulies in the applause and the thank you. So thank you to Dan, our moderator, and our panel. Thank you very much. Um, I also want to thank each of you for participating tonight. Um, you are the reason that we're here and you help us understand the issues and the, the sunshine laws. Um, and I think you've, the panel, you've shown us just how uh, crucial sunlight is to democracy. I also wanna thank our hosts, Shook Hardy and Bacon for allowing us to use this wonderful space. Thank you. I also wanna thank the team um, at the League of Women Voters who put this program together, Nancy Shaver, uh, Terry, Lane, Donna Hoke, and Tommy Sexton. So thank you. A round for them, please. Um, our event was recorded tonight, so it will be available to watch later on the League of Women Voters website. That's lwvkc.org. It'll be up in a couple of days. Um, if you liked what we saw tonight, there is more. We have we and other organizations have a series of forums in advance of the April 2nd election. Um, this week, we have forums for school board candidates in Hickman Mills and Center School Districts. And next week, Independence, Park Hill, and North Kansas City School Boards. So for the full list of upcoming forums, please go to lwvkc.org. Uh, we also invite feedback on this forum and all of our activities. So we'd love to hear from you either tonight, we've got some little sheets you can fill out, or uh, later via our survey. So thank you again for your participation and remember that democracy takes all of us. Thank you.